coming up next on Arizona Horizon. Details on a conference designed to promote Arizona in the global economy. And a rock star and an Arizona mayor help create a winemaking program at a state community college. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Arizona Representative Raul Grijalva was among five congressmen arrested today during an act of civil disobedience at an immigration reform rally that blocked the street in front of the U.S. Capitol. Grijalva's office says the congressman was booked this afternoon and expected to be released this evening. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals today refused to end an injunction against a portion of Arizona's SB 1070 immigration law that makes it a crime to harbor or transport illegal immigrants. A three-judge panel called that part of the law vague and unintelligible. The judges also said it was preempted by federal immigration law. An Arizona state lawmaker is not backing off her comparison of President Obama to Adolf Hitler. Republican Representative Brenda Barton of Payson says the president and Hitler have similar leadership styles. And in an interview with the Arizona Capital Times, Barton also says that, quote, America under Obama is looking a lot like the early days of Germany under Hitler. Barton says she doesn't regret her statements and she doesn't owe the president an apology. And Arizona is no longer the only state denying welfare benefits because of the federal government shutdown. This after the governor reversed policy and ordered state money to go to families who've lost benefits due to the shutdown. The federal government had said all along that it would reimburse states for any money paid to welfare recipients. The ninth annual International State of the State Conference will be held October 15th in Phoenix. The event is hosted by the Phoenix Committee on Foreign Relations and is designed to look at Arizona's place in the global economy. For more, we welcome Glenn Hammer, President and CEO of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Good to see you again, as always. Great to be back on the show, Ted. International State of the State. What is the state of our state in terms of uh, international commerce and, and, and uh, presence? The state of our state in terms of international commerce is, is very strong. Our three top trading partners are Mexico, Canada, Canada, and China in that order. And through the leadership of our state, through all the different things we've done to make the state more competitive with our tax regulatory and tort reform environment, we're seeing very positive developments with, with those three countries as well, as well as our other international trading partners. So in terms of Arizona's place in the global economy, where are we? Well, we export about, uh, about $18 billion worth of goods a year. That's about uh, 25th or so in, in terms of all 50 states. So we're, you know, we're in the middle of the pack. The good news is that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, in terms of our exports, about a third of that $18 billion goes to our friend and neighbor, Mexico, and then uh, about $2 billion or so uh, to our friend, Canada. So the, the, the trade that we're doing with our, with our NAFTA partners is, is really the, the dominant uh, part of our, of our export market right now. But, but a lot of progress in China. Uh, you know, the governor took a very important trade mission to India. Uh, we're seeing some from nice some nice sprouts all over the globe. As far as Arizona's position, though, is it changing? Is it improving? Is it stagnant? I mean, we've had so many variables here with the economy yeah. in general uh, and, and issues here in Arizona in particular. Uh, what kind of trends are you seeing? The 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 trends are are very positive. Uh, what we're seeing also is that as uh, energy costs have have gone up. Uh, it's, it's really uh, made our relationship with Mexico more important. Uh, we're seeing some increased manufacturing uh, opportunities. And I want to commend the governor. She's actually declared that October is manufacturing month in Arizona. And we're, uh, we've been traveling around the state. We'll be in Tucson tomorrow to, to talk about some of the good things we're doing in terms of manufacturing. Uh, manufacturers, by the way, make up uh, about 80 percent worth of our exports when we're talking about renewable equipment, semiconductors defense, uh, uh, mining, uh, such as copper. So, you know, what, what we're seeing is, is, is very positive. The other thing, Ted, is that we, we, in a, we have created a, a far uh, more advantageous environment for manufacturing and exports than what existed three years ago. We, we have right now, as we speak, we have about a half billion dollars of, of, of business tax reform, tax reductions that are, that are scaling in, that make uh, Arizona far more attractive 
for export-oriented industries. Makes Arizona more attractive for export-oriented industries. Is that attraction coming to fruition? Are we seeing folks coming out here because of these ideas and these plans? A absolutely. I mean, every major national business ranking has us going in the right direction. Chief Executive Magazine, we cracked the top 10 a couple of years ago. We now move to, to six. Forbes just ranked us as the, uh, uh, as, as the state with the, uh, the, the, the most positives in terms of job creation going forward. So if you're not looking in the rearview mirror, you're looking forward. Forbes had us basically in the number one position as, as the most attractive place uh, in, in terms of expected job creation. So every indicator is going in, in is really going in, in the right direction right now. What are the biggest challenges, though, in terms of understanding global trends and then acclimating yourself to those trends? Well, developing, you know, doing work abroad is not easy. I, I think I saw a statistic that only about 1% of companies actually export goods. So it's a pretty small percentage of our companies. Uh, fortunately, uh, through the creation of the Arizona Commerce Authority, you know, Sandra Watson, who's, who's leading that entity, has really done a great job of, of building a team uh, that, that, could, uh, that could take advantage of these opportunities. We have other leaders in the Valley, like Barry Broom of GPEC, who've been doing a very good year, a very good job over the course of many years to sell Arizona abroad. Uh, the governor has been uh, very active in terms of selling uh, Arizona. Uh, so, you know, Ted, I, we're, we're very encouraged at the chamber. We've got a good story to tell, and we're doing a much better job of telling that story around the globe. I, and, and indeed, telling that story is, is a major issue, I would imagine, especially when other stories are being told. Arizona's image nationally, and I'm guessing internationally, uh, curious at best. Some will say there's a problem there. Others say it's not quite as big a problem as some would imagine. But the fact is, we make headlines, good or bad. Those headlines, uh, how does that impact doing business? So we would ju I, I just had the opportunity to be on a trade, bipartisan trade mission that Speaker Andy Tobin led, led to Mexico. Uh, four Republicans, three, three Democrats from the, from the State House. Uh, the, the focus of those conversations, we had the chance to meet with uh, uh, probably over 10 federal Mexican lawmakers. The focus on, on, on virtually all those conversations were on our trading opportunities. How do we make our, how do we improve our ports of entry? How do we improve our customs process? Uh, the focus is, 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 is really positive, Ted. And I know, you know, there, there's always those concerns about different headlines that have been out there over, over the years. But right now, the focus is really all positive. It's on things we can do to improve our trading relationships, particularly with our neighbors. So if, Ari if Arizona's image was a certain thing, has that certain thing changed over the years? I, I, I feel that our image is, is very positive. Uh, people love the state. We're the Grand Canyon state. It's a, it's a gorgeous state. Uh, when I travel, uh, when I've had the chance to travel abroad or, or, or in, 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 the, in the continental United States, people love coming here. They, they have a very positive view of the state of Arizona. And, and, and that's being tracked by all of the, uh, the, the developments that we're seeing in, in the positive way in terms of job creation and, and, the, and the rankings from national uh, organizations. So what do we look for in terms of some sort of metric, some sort of uh, measurement here uh, that shows that all of these plans, these ideas, yeah. the tax cuts, the policy, that they are really moving in the right direction? I mean, the last unemployment figures didn't look too hot. Of course, they were seasonal there, but they still didn't look too hot. They're, they're, they're seasonal, and we're, 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 we're adding jobs. So in terms of the metrics that we should be looking at, yes, I mean, unemployment rates are important. Uh, when we're talking about just in terms of our theme, international state, state of the state, uh, we should be looking at what's going on with our export number. We're at 18 billion. Uh, you know, the president put a national goal out there to double exports over a five-year period. Uh, we want to see that number continue to go up. So, so, so that's a number that we need to that we need to look at. And that's and and, and I'm very very confident with with the with with the new policies we have in place. And the incredible coordination that we're seeing, led by the Arizona Commerce Authority and our excellent, excellent economic development groups, Ted, we're, we're, we're going to see b several billions of dollars added to that export figure. All right. And we'll watch the International State of the State <laughs> Conference again coming up here. Good to have you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on the show, Ted.
expand your horizon with the Arizona Horizon website. To get there, go to azpbs.org. Click on the Arizona Horizon tab at the top of the screen. Once there, you can access many features. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button. You can also find out what's on Arizona Horizon for the coming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or want to buy a video, that's all on the website too. Want to learn about specific topics like immigration or the legislature? You can visit our special web sections. Show your support for Arizona Horizon at azpbs.org slash Arizona Horizon. A wine education center has been set up at Yavapai College near Prescott through a unique alliance. The Southwest Wine Center on the Verde Valley campus in Clarkdale is a premier academic center supporting wine growers throughout the Southwest. Our next two guests have been instrumental in developing the wine center. Maynard James Keenan is a winemaker and musician for the rock band Tool, and Nikki Check is the mayor of the town of Jerome. Good to have you both here on Arizona Horizon. Thanks for having us. Well, thank you. Let's talk, start with you, Maynard, here. The purpose, the, the Southwest Wine Center, what is this all about? Uh, it's an incubator for uh, local people trying to get into the wine business, uh, trying to find their way, find their strengths, determine their weaknesses, move forward uh, with people like Nikki at the helm, uh, kind of kind of guiding people through vineyard management, through enology. It's a working uh, wine winery, so there's practical experience. Is it for budding connoisseurs, budding vintners, both? Vintners, v any, mostly uh, for vintners. And growers. So, uh, so people working in the field and both in the field and in the winery itself. It sounds like you're training people to work in the wine industry. We indeed are. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, I got that one right, didn't I? Um, talk to me more about how you were doing this and, and how, you, how you start with an idea and get it to fruition. Well, really, Yavapai College is just responding to an industry that's growing very, very quickly. And to fully understand that, I think it's important to understand Arizona's history a little bit with uh, winemaking, really. Um, in the 1700s, New Mexico and Arizona actually had more wine grapes planted than California. And <clears throat> uh, we continued to have a successful wine industry all the way up until Prohibition. Sedona itself had a 72-acre vineyard planted that was operational for 25 years hmm. before then. So really, we've just been making up for lost ground since. It didn't become legal to direct market your wine through a tasting room until 2006. And so we grew from 10 wineries to 84 licenses, I think, in the hmm. state really, really rapidly. And there's just kind of been a vacuum. We're just trying to catch up and provide some skilled labor and provide a place for entrepreneurs to get on their feet. And, and what kind of career opportunities are there out there? When you're working the, the fields here, what kind of jobs are available? Uh, it's, it's pretty infinite because you've got to figure there, there's, the, there's the obvious. There's the winemaker, assistant winemaker, seller managers, but anybody who's into uh, it's just marketing in general, uh, into cuisine, uh, into uh, distributorship, uh, if you work on... If you work on tractors or forklifts, uh, you have a you have a job for sure. I just had a guy down today trying to figure out what that squeak was on my forklift. <laughs> um, and, and as far as, as, as teaching, I mean, again, it sounds like an agricultural course for the most part. Absolutely, and it's the reason why we were able to build a two-year degree so quickly. We um, at Yavapai College have an agricultural degree already, and so we folded. Uh, those courses into our first one-year certificate program for viticulture and then you know hired a, an enology director for winemaking and are breaking ground on the, our actual winemaking facility this fall. And, and uh, until, is there much hands-on experience right now? In fact, we try to pair each academic course with a full-time in-the-field course. So every semester uh, students get 60 hours in the field in both viticulture and enology. And, and a campus, we're talking campus winery here, correct? Yes. It's, and, a, it's a working, functioning winery. It's not built yet. We're still finding <laughs> yes, it. Yes, yes. It's, it's on its way. Where, where did this, uh, this idea come from? Was this uh, sitting over a couple of glasses here or just, just what? Well, in, in the state itself, uh, California, you have UC Davis, which started as a small community college and blossomed into this go-to facility for everybody around the country to you know, send them vines to be cleaned up, to be put into nurseries, to be planted in your vineyard. Like it's, it's, there's all these different avenues that came out of that one facility, and I think we saw that opportunity in, in Galvapai County to, to, to grow this thing to the point where it's covering a lot of those bases because their problems aren't necessarily our problems. So we're discovering all the hurdles uh, as we go, and we kind of need that 
that place to kind of gather all that data. What are some of the problems that you hear from grape growers and winemakers in the region? Well, one obvious thing is that we don't quite know what to grow yet. Um, and it really was UC Davis helping in Napa to decipher, you know, where, where exactly should they be growing Cabernet Sauvignon and where should they be growing uh, Pinot Noir. And so uh, we've got an, an immense array of varietals planted in Arizona and sifting through what works and what doesn't is an, an important thing that the Yavapai College uh, campus vineyard is going to be doing specifically. And then we'll be partnering with the U of A. <clears throat> They'll be helping us by letting us use their server and we'll be opening up a website so that growers and winemakers throughout the state can be submitting their data and their observations. So again, when I, when I heard about this story, I was thinking, okay, this is for young folks who want to get into the business. The more I hear about it, it's also for folks who are already in the business to accelerate their learning as well. Talk about that, that dynamic. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of people that come over this way from California. I have a friend who you know, almost jumped ship from California with his, uh, with his uh, family business to come and establish himself here. Uh, I'm still working on it, but uh, you know it's something that you can come here with your knowledge, uh, and but rather than it being a completely risky endeavor, if we have some of this knowledge going in of uh, what varietals work best on what sites, somebody like that who already has experience in a very large pond and being a small fish in California can come here and have a little bit more wiggle room to be more established and actually like set up a, a better standard. When we talk about the wine industry in the region the impact, the economic impact now and what it could be in the future. What are you seeing out there? Uh, well, gosh, a couple of years ago when they did their economic impact study on the Verde Valley itself, I think they came up with a number like 25 million and we've outgrown our statistics so quickly it has to be about 45 million uh, dollars worth of impact within the Verde Valley and I think we just have the sky to reach because we've only really been building this industry um, in its proper fashion in, in high quality wine production since 2006 is when we've had our leg up. So. And building the industry means restaurants, I would imagine, homes, Absolutely. hotels, I mean the whole nine yards. And currently we only have one winery that's producing enough wine to distribute nationally and internationally, Arizona Stronghold Vineyards. And so getting more land in production and more wineries up and running. Um, and Maynard's actually helping with that goal by uh, opening up what's called the 4-8 Wine Works. It's also in progress, um, <laughs> but uh, as a, an incubator facility for people who think they want to make wine, think they have an edge and in, in a direction in their winemaking style, but don't have the capital. So it would be a, a shared equipment facility so that people can get on their feet. Talk to us more about that because we hear about incubators all the time yep. for small startups. 4-8 uh, Wine Works, named after the 48th state, uh, Arizona. Um, we've, we have the press, we have the facility, we have the distemory, we have all the equipment. A lot of guys starting up don't have $250,000 laying around to kind of get going. So this, this facility is meant to be an alternating proprietorship where somebody with talent and experience can come and uh, be left to uh, create their own destiny with their wine label. Um, we're, I'm offering for the, for the FFI College program, whoever their top graduate is, who's really kind of kind of risen to the top, mm -hmm. they have a spot at the 48 Wine Works to kind of get their start. Interesting. Uh, you talk about trying to get a friend from California over to here. Talk to us about how you got over to he over here, first of all, and secondly, was winemaking something in your family's <laughs> background? What, yeah. what, give us a little bit of a, a concise uh, background here. What got you into well, all this? You've been to L.A. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can't I grow any grapes there on Ventura <laughs> Boulevard. Yeah. I left. I, I left. I, w I lived there for about five years and ran away screaming in '95 and moved straight to Jerome, where there's 340 people. It was better for me. <laughs> is, is it still better for you though? Because I mean, things are happening up there now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's still a really close knit, uh, very creative, uh, aggressive community. <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a very wonderful place as a to look at what that place is and all the people that ever have their solid opinions and, and lifestyle it's a great place to be is it a great place to grow grapes and if so Absolutely. why is it the weather the soil the water what is it uh, the elevation uh, the soils everything about it the terroir just in in the Verde Valley alone on the slopes uh, in general uh, it's very much like places like Mount Etna like Spain uh, parts of Portugal um, there's some there's some similarity to some of the areas that I've been uh, been in Adelaide Hills, a little less moisture, uh, but but the terrain itself is very conducive to Spanish, uh, Italian varietals, uh, 
uh, even southern Rhone varietals. Mm. Uh, and cab, of course, grows like a weed, so it grows really well here uh, too. But yeah, uh, to go to, to answer your question about the family, I have a great grandfather who made wine in northern Italy. Oh uh, my God! Okay. But All I right. didn't actually know that until I was actually breaking ground, and a distant cousin kind of brought it up. <laughs> oh, by the way. Oh, by the way. Yeah. You've made wine in your DNA. Yeah. Well, all right. And 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 speaking of DNA. Jerome's DNA, it's, it's <laughs> always been a curious place and a wonderful place to go how, to. But how not, kind. Not, Those are kind not words. Not many folks <laughs> stay or last too long when they do stay. Um, how are the old timers feeling about all this stuff happening? <laughs> You're on the spot now. <laughs> well, what we didn't mention maybe is that I'm also the mayor, yes, the volunteer are, yes. mayor. <laughs> so I do spend a lot of time with some of the old timers. They've, some have been on you know, volunteer council for 20 years or so. And there are mixed results, of course. You know, people, when you move to a ghost town and you'd like it to stay that way, mm -hmm. uh, but you'd also like your sewage to be properly delivered somewhere and your water to be delivered on a rickety system from six springs up on a mountain, it's a tough call to make. <laughs> Indeed. So, so are, you, are you getting a little bit of pushback or is that pushback softening as, as folks kind of see what's happening? It indeed is softening. I think people are really starting to see that especially wine tasting rooms are not bars. Uh, they attract a completely different crowd. They're wrapped up and cleaned up by 7 p.m. and it really is inviting a nice high-end crowd to peruse the art galleries. So, so folks in Jerome were worried that the wine <laughs> tasting rooms would turn into bar? They were worried about that. Yeah, right? you know, the biker gangs, they really gravitate towards w sipping wine in the afternoon. <laughs> and stabbings and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so now, yeah, you're there to stay, yeah. I would imagine. Um, and, and you, you started helped start this, this wine center. Where do you want to see it go? I mean, again, we're talking about Jerome. We're talking about a place you escaped to. How far do you want to see this develop? I mean, uh, um, well, I'd like to see it find its, uh, you know, of course you always wanted to kind of get to a certain point and kind of stop. Uh, but there's a lot of small microclimates up in that area. I would love to see people with a uh, true vision kind of develop those small microclimates and create that very unique uh, boutique artisanal uh, setting in, in all those areas. I don't really, I don't really see the Verde Valley becoming this sprawl of vineyards across the entire valley. I just don't see that happening. It's just not, the land's too expensive. It's not necessarily conducive. Uh, there's a lot of, we get a lot of late spring frost. So there's a lot of weather issues that would mm -hmm. prevent it just from being a sprawling uh, vineyard territory. But there's some really cool little areas all the way, you know, all the way through uh, all the hills there. It's going to be interesting to see how it pans out, but that's what I'd like to see. And as far as the Southwest Wine Center, again, talk about vision of uh, folks who have that drive. There's always a little bit of an argument of, uh, regarding can you teach that, can you teach the arts, can you teach someone to be a front man in a band through a classroom, or do you have to just do it? You can get that online. You can get it, yeah, exactly. But I mean, as far as the Southwest, can you teach this stuff, or does it have to be a little bit in your DNA? Oh, no. I, I think, well, one thing to know about this, the industry, especially on the growing side, is that it's not very intuitive, um, especially growing. You really don't treat grapes like you treat other crops. And so people who have been farmers previously who have green thumbs might think, I can grow anything, I can grow wine grapes. Well, there's some nuts and bolts to really know about, uh, you know, if you would like to succeed. There's plenty of failures to be had in the vineyard. And um, I think some nuts and bolts information is super important. Um, and you absolutely can teach that. I think teaching an art is interesting. You really have to get as broad as you possibly can <clears throat> and teach all aspects of things because there's so much stylistically that dictates how you grow wine grapes, how you make your wine, and just opening people up to as much as possible and then letting them run with it. Well, it sounds very interesting. Again, at Yavapai College, you can get a, a degree, a, a certificate, and learn about the art of wine. Good to have you both here. Congratulations on the success. Thank you. Thank you. Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, flu season has started. We'll get an update from Arizona's top health official and best-selling author Bill Bryson talks about his writing career, including a new book that focuses on historic events in the summer of 1927. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.
Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.